Well, thank you for coming tonight. We are honored to be a part of the Hal Leonard warm-up band, so to speak, for the Sandbar Storytelling Festival. In a little over an hour, we are going to condense 100 years into an hour. So bear with us. Hal Leonard Publishing is the largest music publisher in the world, uh, first earning that distinction in 1981. It was founded in Winona in 1947, right here in River City. Though its corporate offices are now in Milwaukee, Hal Leonard has two facilities in town, one housing the presses and printing operations on uh, East Mark Street, the other on uh, um, east of that, East of uh, uh, Menards, a large distribution warehouse. It employed 700 people worldwide. And to think it all started about two blocks from here on the corner of 3rd and Center Streets, uh, actually 4th Street around the corner also, and that goes back into the mid-40s. You're going to hear the rest of that story shortly. There you go. Part of storytelling is exploring roots, and all three men had loving parents who passed on their love of music, but also instilled in them that sense of discipline to make the most of their talents. Uh, their upbringing and experiences helped shape them as creative, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial men and musicians. Harold Burton Edstrom and Everett Leonard Edstrom were born in the southwestern town of Worthington. And my dad, or Hal, was born on February 12, 1914. Ed was born uh, December 12, 1950. And uh, Roger Harry Bustaker was born in Winona on August 26, 1917. World War I, the Roaring Twenties, and the Great Depression were all part of their growing up years. Is this volume good? Yes. Money? Yes. All right, good. Hal and Ed were the firstborn sons of Ernie and Elsa Edstrom, both of whose parents emigrated from Sweden and Germany, respectively. Ernie made his living as a piano tuner. The boys were innovators from the start, along with their sister Genevieve, should be up here. Their first development project was building a doghouse for their little dog Buster, which basically their first <laughs> partnership. It goes back about 1922, so about 100 years ago, they were probably standing in front of that doghouse. Soon their youngest sister, Beverly, joined the family. It was the two boys who were driven the hardest by their father to produce great music. They both started out on trumpet, practicing as much as four hours a night after dinner. They would, they would play out of the Church of the Brethren hymnal, in those days, there was not much printed uh, music, and uh, their dad would uh, make sure that they got their four hours in, and that's what uh, was kind of the foundation of their musical uh, musical life. They played alongside, as I said, uh, the, the the Church of the Brethren hymnal, and um, here you see them in the Worthington High School band, which was actually quite renowned at the time. Ed was especially passionate and disciplined about his trumpet playing, winning the state championship at only 14. See him in the middle up there. Please listen now to our cousin Steve, who is perhaps the best storyteller in the whole family, having had his own talk shows in Minneapolis and San Francisco. You might wonder why he's, his name became Jameson. He was uh, at WCCO for a long time, and then he went to KSTP up in the cities back in the 1970s. He hated winters, and getting up early in the morning, he had a show called uh, Country Day, or I think it was, and he had to be up at 5 in the morning and go on the show at 6 o'clock, and he just he tested that. So he went out to San Francisco, and they said he got a TV show uh, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And they said, you know, we have to do something about that name. He said, why? What's wrong with Steve Esther? And he said, it's too Swedish. We don't know the Swedish names out here. So they said, what's your middle name? He said, James. You're going to be Steve Jameson. The rest is history ever since then. <laughs>
Unfortunately, a heart attack took his life early at age 45. Roger was active in the Winona High School Band, also in the Winona Athletic Association Band, shown here, as a clarinetist. And as a young boy, he was attracted to Winona State Teachers College because of its musical reputation. As we tell the story of these men and the music company they created, I'd like to highlight the role of fate in the Hallam story. Case in point is uh, the role of Jo Millen, who is the mother of us, oh, a very good friend of ours, and maybe yours, Janelle Moore. Where's, there's Janelle, yes. <laughs> <laughs> who went to school one year ahead of Hal in Worthington. And when she found out that he was thinking of going to Mankato State for his college years, she said, Hal, you got to go to Winona State. That's where the best music is. That's where you got to go. The music program is outstanding. Well, Hal listened, and that changed everything. What, what, what we kind of like to think of is would Hal Leonard or any of Ev's and Hal's and Roger's kids, for that matter, exist without that good piece of advice? <laughs> <laughs> so Hal arrived at Winona State Teachers College in 1932. He was bold enough as a freshman to ask then President Maxwell, as in Maxwell Library, if he could direct the TC marching band. He was given approval by saying, Harold, if you get your kid brother who just won that national contest over here to attend school next fall, you got the job. <laughs> the band was quite young at the time, and uh, so he took that job and uh, started uh, at that point directing. So, Ev also got to co-direct the TC band with his brother and on his own after Hal graduated, so it kind of went down the line as, as, uh, with Roger. Uh, you see him here in 1936 on the steps, uh, steps of Sopson Hall as the band's drum major. And there's Roger and his clarinet behind him on the steps. Roger started at uh, Teachers College in the fall of 1934. He was an excellent saxophonist and a remarkable clarinetist. Ev was a virtuoso trumpet player, as we've just stated. And Hal could play just about anything. That was his, uh, his, his gift. They started the first dance band in 1934. A lot happened in those years at TC, like the development of new teaching methods for high school bands, and in 1935, the first use of the name Hal Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite stories is that Al, uh, in his later years, was interviewed by Steve, his son, uh, who asked him to tell the family about his fondest memory of all times. And Ev got a dreamy look in his eye and he said, oh, that's simple. Mabel. <laughs> the kid said, but Dad, what about Mom? What about us? What about Helen? No. Well, he was talking about Mabel, the town, and the wonderful <laughs> memory he said. <laughs> I was instructed to let them get all the way across before I continued. <laughs> all right. um, he, he assured them all that they were the fairest of them all, but he, he had this very sweet memory of working with the Mabel High School Band. Um, he absolutely loved traveling there with Hal. Uh, it, it was a three-hour round trip, and they did it twice a week. And what they would do, they, they'd go down and work with the high school kids, and uh, they arrived in 1935, and by 1936, 
the high school had won its first state championship. This is a little town. The Mabel program was started as an experimental teaching program or an opportunity for students at Teachers College. We're going to call it TC, but it's Winona State. Um, some uh, students like Roger himself uh, made the commute to help out the high school students. And it was very innovative. There were only a few programs of its kind in the entire nation at the time. Part of their unique approach in building that championship band was to make arrangements of popular tunes, tunes that kids could play. They could pick it up and learn it in no time. Here you see the Illinois, uh, uh, what was it, the Illinois March. marching band. <laughs> uh, there weren't a whole lot of marching bands who were doing halftime shows like this. And it was one of the innovations they had. They loved teaching the students these uh, pop tunes, and they also had them uh, divide, devise exciting marching techniques and uh, halftime shows. So this was a new phenomenon in the country. And after Hal graduated in 1936, Ev took over, and uh, under his direction, Mabel won two more state championships. And then in 1938, it won its first national championship. This was big news. If any of you have been to Mabel, you know it's a small town. <laughs> so, and it always held a very special place in Ev's heart and memory. Dances of the dance bands that performed them were big deals to the kids of the 30s. <laughs> Dances were exciting. They gave young folks a chance to make friends and possibly even meet a future partner in life. The three started up their first dance band in the fall of 1934. Get on your eyes. Oh, the no, party right. I was supposed to pause there, but I guess I got there before I Get got to that right. point. <laughs> Which, for some unknown reason, they called the Little German Band. They quickly changed that and had new senses because they were on a college campus, renamed it the Campus Kings, with the K and the K. And the following year, they rebranded again, this time naming it the Hallandic Orchestra. This was the first time the name Hallander was used. One interesting story involves how that came to be. How did the Hallander name come up instead of Edster? Well, um, because the family had a strict upbringing in the Church of the Brethren in Worthington, in which there was no drinking, smoking, playing cards, or even dancing for that matter, Evan Hall assumed that it would be an insult for their parents to have a dance band and play in all these body dance halls <laughs> and carry the family name. So they decided instead to play around with their given names. Starting with Hal's first name, they found that when combined with Ev's middle name, Leonard, it made a most lyrical moniker for the band, not to mention a good story. The irony of it, irony of it was when they went to Worthington the way, on the way to one of their gigs, they stayed overnight with the Estrom family. All of the extended family gathered around Uwe and I, this fine new uh, band in the sleeper bus, Showing in their, uh, sh shivering in their boots, Hal and Ed waited for Ernie's response. Ernie looked at them and said, hmm, pretty impressive, but tell me, why didn't you name it the Edstrom Brothers Band? <laughs> <laughs> While playing in a big band may to some seem very exciting, times weren't always glamorous. It was long, hard, low-paying work. And because it was led by Hal and Ev and their ingrained belief in the power of practicing, and a lot of it, band members had to practice any time there was a spare moment. Ev was the hard-driving leader of the band. His business card designated him the featured director of the Hal Leonard Orchestra. It was, after all, his trumpet playing that was the showstopper. It was set up initially as a cooperative, band members sharing equally of what at times were pretty meager takings. The trailer itself was a rather flimsy affair, made from canvas stretched over a very simple wooden frame. It wasn't heated, it wasn't comfortable, and it wasn't good for much of anything except for carrying instruments. It, wasn't co it was not a cozy spot to hang out as Chuck Golds, a Worthington native recruited by Hal and Ev to come to TC, described in his stories about his travels with the band. In this story, traveling to gigs, in the winter. Here's Chuck's recollection of one incident. The band traveled down the road in a big old DeSoto, which the original band members had made and was owned cooperatively. 
The trailer had a good solid frame and a hitch, but the body was constructed of painted canvas stretched over laths. The Midwestern winters were viciously cold, and it was the cold and snow that gave us some of our greatest problems. In those days, the dance bands got only one break or an intermission of 20 minutes or so, um, and the dance hall manager made sure that the band didn't take any longer than that. That 20 minute break was often spent in getting the car, which had been standing out in the sub-zero temperatures, started and warmed up a little so that it could be started once again after the dance. We really bundled up against the cold, but even so it was bitter, even in the car with its heater, especially in the back seat, and you can imagine the fierce chill in the unheated trailer. We rotated positions so the same fellow did not get the trailer every trip, and especially one fellow didn't always sit next to the door, which was a real bone chiller. I remember almost literally freezing to death on one trip, and of how the other fellows ran me up and down the frozen highway exhorting me to wake up Chuck, wake up! And how all I wanted to do was to go to sleep. A sleep from which there would have been no awakening. You, you see here the result of a car crash that was nearly fatal for Hal and Elle, who both sustained serious back injuries in the crash, Hal almost died from the burning oil, and he carried those scars for the rest of his life. Uh, Ev uh, would seriously, severely re-injure his back when he was in the Navy, so the two of them fought back problems their whole lives. Um, you look at this car, and you think how easily it could have ended their lives. So once again, it brings back the role of fate, and they must have had a true music-loving angel in their corner. <laughs> Oh, after TC, each took different paths. Hal's first job was at the junior high teaching science of all things. And uh, then he was uh, asked to direct, the next year, asked to direct the senior high band. And he met Joe Challen in the church choir. And uh, I'm going to go rogue here. i got to tell the story. She thought he was a little too young for her. But she, he sat just a little bit in front of her in the church choir, and she noticed that he had the sexiest ankle in the whole world. <laughs> it was love at first sight. <laughs> they were married and not too much later, in <laughs> 1938. Um, after that, um, let's see, uh, oh, I keep, oh, Hal became in 1940. After the untimely death of its director, Hal became Winona's municipal band director, and he held on to that post for the next 33 years. Uh, Roger met Martha Faulkner in high school, and we read that she had a very cool, sporty coupe with a rumble seat. <laughs> they were married in December of 1938. Uh, Roger reunited with Mabel High School in 1939, leading its band to a third national championship in 1940. Ev continued to lead the Hal Leonard Orchestra with Roger staying in the band till he went off to teach in Clarissa, Minnesota. In the spring of 1938, they got rid of that drafty homemade teardrop canvas trailer and brought a fancy new sleeper <coughs> bus, as you see on the uh, slides. It served them much better. Always loving to goof around, they appreciated the larger space to do it in, with plenty of light bunk beds and even a heater. Oftentimes, living in a closed, closer quarters can be difficult, but it seems that under Ed's leadership, this group had a lot of laughs and got along quite well. <laughs> Starting in 1938, the band was getting people's attention, every poster emblazoned with the slogan, Rhythm is our business. And Ed, being the band's front man and polishing his suave and debonair image, takes on the name, uh, or actually became known as Hal Leonard. Though not traveling with the band anymore, Al was still doing the band's bookings and contracting multiple week gigs through the Midwest. Including that, and some of those were uh, the name that you might all remember for something more uh, famous, and that was the playing in the surf ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa. I'm sure a lot of you will uh, remember that. I'm going to read one other little story here that was written by the same gentleman who wrote what Joni wrote. Um, as you know, um, back in those days, they, they had to get to a lot of dance spots at 
all over the place. I mean, it wasn't nice, you know, went out of Lewiston to St. Charles. It was all over the place. And one of the reasons that they um, had the sleeper was, again, as we said, was just to uh, be able to stay um, sleep on the way back to classes. Uh, Chuck Colts told a story that's what we call the Max Conrad story. There again, I know in one case they had to play in Iowa in um, on a Saturday night, and they had to go to you know, Western South Dakota for a Sunday night, and be back literally for class and exams Monday morning at eight o'clock. So at that point, they decided, well, I guess we're going to have to uh, call Max Conrad, who most of you know the name of, and so I find out if he can ferry us on the plane, which is the background there. The try it's called a Ford, Ford tri motor airplane. So it, it was a little scary because uh, Max, as most of you know, was not exactly, uh, he, he took a lot of chance, became known as the Winona's flying grandfather, and he was a wonderful pilot, but he was a bit of a daredevil. So this is uh, Max, Conrad, Max Conrad's story according to Chuck Holtz, who again was playing in the band at the time. Since by this time the Helen Orchestra was, pro uh, was prospering, we made contact with a local aviator, Max Conrad, who flies in his tin goose, a Ford tri-motor. When our scheduling got too tight and the distances were too far apart, and I read it's verbatim so I don't miss something. On one occasion, Max flew us down from our engagement at the surf ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa, of Buddy Holly fame. You were wondering. We arrived out at the Des Moines airport about 2 a.m. to find it socked in. The fog so deep and heavy there was no chance for an immediate takeoff. We climbed in and I soon fell asleep in my seat. I remember being disturbed by the motors turning as we took off, but I was soon back to sleep. Later I awakened to look out the window to find the trees and telephone lines just beneath our wheels and Max desperately searching for some place to set the big plane down. <laughs> I had been a very wet, it, had, it had been a very wet spring and all of North Iowa seemed like one big lake. The section we were flying over was flat prairie country with no standing water on it, or with a lot of standing water on it. Max was able to head up the slope and expertly land the Ford Trimotor. He said afterward that he had expected the wheels to sink into the marshy ground at any minute which, if it had occurred, might well have catapulted us end over end. Well, we made it safe to the nearest farmhouse to use the phone to call back to Winona with the news of our predicament. In the meantime, the sodden ground began to engulf the plane's wheels, and by the time our friends had returned from the house, the plane was almost belly deep and sinking fast. <laughs> we unloaded everything movable from the plane, maxed down the motors, with all of us pushing and lifting. After spinning in a half circle, the plane lurched into a soft spot and settled deeper than ever. <laughs> the farmer, long experienced with problems of mud and heavy equipment, brought two teams of big draft horses, block and tackle, chains, planks, and shovels, but to no avail. Word soon got around that a plane was down in Charlie Johnson's pasture, and neighboring farmers began to pour in with more equipment. The day cleared and the sun came out, but the plane, st the plane still sank deeper. In disgust, Ed called for the sleeper bus to come and get us. Then, as we were finally returning to Winona, Max buzzed us and waggled the wings. <laughs> he had finally gotten out, and he got home before we did. <laughs> It was 20 years later that Buddy Holly left in an airplane from the very same ballroom that Ed and Hal and her band had been playing, but it wasn't as lucky. So, we are going to say, finally, they were starting to make good money as they were doing their touring. Checks for gigs, uh, for gigs in March 1940 totaled $1,000. That's equivalent to about $21,000 in today's money. In March 1941, the band got a huge break by giving performance at the Rainbow Room in Denver that was broadcast nationally on the Mutual Broadcasting Network. Here in Winona, that was heard on KWNO. That's 12.30 on your dial. <laughs> You've heard that before. What was the secret of the emerging success? At the time, dance bands were very competitive for bookings. It required a band to find a creative hook, something that made them unique and distinctive versus all the other bands out there. For the Atlantic Orchestra, the hook was their triple tongue trumpet trio. Steve takes the story from here. Thank <laughs> you. 
out that these guys were in their early to mid twenties playing that. So this was not some seasoned band that had been playing for 30, 40, 50 years. So that was their own arrangement and their own playing. I'll mention that John Ringling North actually wanted the triple tonguing trumpet trio to play in the Ringling Brothers Circus. Ev turned them down. <laughs> but <clears throat> it was still an honor. Uh, then the band met up with Pearl. The band was making it big with plans to go to New York City following the gig at Chicago's premier ballroom, the Trina. But please note the date. Saturday, December 6th, 1941. Pearl Harbor. It happened the very next day. The band continued to perform gigs going into 1942, but everyone knew its days were numbered. In the spring of 1942, Ed was called up for service, and he went into the Navy that summer in Norfolk. Uh, you see Ev here before he shipped out, holding my oldest brother, Lee. And he still led a dance band after hours with fellow sailors. And he gave puppet lessons to a fellow sailor's son in exchange for lessons in photography, which was a real passion for Ev. Um, he severely injured his back, as I mentioned earlier, and was discharged from the Navy that fall. After leaving the Navy, he trained for a career in photography by attending the, get this, Winona Lake School of Photography in Indiana. <laughs> he returned to Winona in 1944 to work at pre-work photography studio, and that same year, he married Mary Crow. In the summer of 1943, Roger enlisted in the Army Air Reserves. After extensive training, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant and served as a navigator on B-24 and B-29 bombers through the, remaining, the remainder of the war. In 1945, he returned to Minnesota to resume teaching at Mabel High School and the following year at Winona State Teachers College. <coughs> in December of 1944, Ev and Hal bought out the pre-work photography studio, the place that Ev had been employed since returning to town, and they set up their first retail gig, Edstrom Photo Studio, at 69 4th Street in downtown Winona. A year later, Edstrom Music Store opened. <laughs> In case you don't recognize that, that's where the new part of City Hall is, the western half that was just built a number of years ago. Besides being a portrait studio, the Edstrom Photo Studio sold cameras, photo development, and some musical instruments. And since both brothers are handy with a camera, they take photos around town and submit them to the newspaper or take photos of the table side at popular dance and supper clubs in the area, like the Oaks. At that time, the whole nation was going through an accordion craze fueled by Myron Florin <laughs> and the Lawrence Welk Show. Never to miss an opportunity, Hal and Ed created an accordion studio on the second floor of their photo studio. <laughs> they drew big classes for accordion lessons. Accordion is not a particularly easy instrument to master. Here's a photo of John, Steve, Tom, and Lee playing accordion. <laughs> John's face on the left tells it all. <laughs> I think Helen never remembered the fact that when the next instrument they started selling wasn't easier to play Hammond organ. As, as a side note, Dick Hell came to work at the photo studio in 1956 and followed in the footsteps of Ev. He bought this uh, Boston studio in 64, soon changing the name to Ellis. Seeing that the photo studio was not large enough to fit their needs, Hal resigned from high school, from the high school band, in the summer of 1945, and along with Ev, opened the Edstrom Music Store. Kitty Corner from Chokes, or today it's Heart's Desire, in December of 1945. They made it a happening place. You can see all the people outside. Now, maybe this photo was taken for a big opening event, or perhaps Ev was just making like the drum major of his uh, TC days and letting everybody think they were in the band. <laughs> but at the music store, they sold cameras, radios, musical instruments for sale or rental. There was also music instruction and many records for sale. Uh, it was, um, you could also listen to records in the listening booths at the back of the store. It was the Spotify of the day. <laughs> Sister Camille Bo 
president of the College of St. Teresa from 1950 to 1967, told me that it was a favorite Saturday outing for the CST sisters to go to the Edstrom studio and listen to records. <laughs> <laughs> Al and Up still loved playing in a band, and every day at noon they would gather with store employees and former band members, like Roger taking his lunch break from Winona State, and uh, they would make beautiful music together again. You could hear the music live on KWNO or brave the large crowds that came to hear the gig and uh, live and in person. As we approach 1947, the year the Hal Leonard Music Company was born and the twinklings of a Hal Leonard publishing empire were just about to begin. Let's take a moment to review the birth happenings in Hal, Ev, and Roger's households. All three men had families at about the same period of time. Thirteen children were born from 1942 to 1955. Hal and Joe had four boys and a girl starting in 1942. Ev and Mary had the first of their five children, one boy and four girls, starting in 1945. Raj and Martha had the first of three girls in 1945. Almost everyone played musical instruments, and thanks to Ed's wife, Mary, there were also some excellent dancers and dance teachers among the girls. My sisters and I all played organ, guitar, and sang. My two sisters played in the municipal band, and two of us pursued musical careers. My middle sister, Judy, was a music educator, and myself as a solo violinist. I continued my career for over 30 years, touring with two Celtic bands on the road, like my dad, up until 2009. 1947 was a big year for all three of the music men. That was the year that uh, they incorporated their business, the Hal Leonard Music Company, which included its publishing arm, Hal Leonard Publishing. It's also the year that Roger officially rejoined Hal and Ed. When you think about marching bands of yesteryear, you have to remember that before Hal and Ev appeared on the scene, the traditional school march ba marching band was basically military-style columns parading down straight lines, playing the John Philip Sousa music of the 1890s. Hal, had, Hal was the one who had a talent for arranging. Uh, it was fun hearing this from Steve. He, according to him, he said he had no formal training, he learned by being in the band. He learned by doing it, and he did it well. He had a lot of practice in both Mabel and Winona High School, and uh, as we mentioned, in order to get kids interested in playing music, he would take pop tunes and make interesting arrangements of them, and very easy to play and still very effective. He had just a great instinct for choosing good contemporary tunes. He also designed the halftime shows, and um, for kids along with Ev, and uh, often he did it for other band directors. One night when Hal had to leave a cocktail party early to finish an arrangement for someone else, Joe said to him, you know Hal, you could maybe make a little money doing this, so maybe you should make a business out of that. We don't know just how she put it, but at that rate, we kind of think that might have been a little bit of the impetus, but she said later, it wasn't her idea, he was already thinking of it. <laughs> oh. Roger joined Hal Leonard as its president after finishing up the 1947 school year at Teachers College. He quickly got down to work at building the school music market based on the successes all three had within the school bands. There never seemed to be any control issues or problem in juggling leadership roles. Their formula was, one, create arrangements of popular tunes that even an average school musician could master, two, develop marching techniques and turnkey halftime shows that a school's band director could easily execute, and three, keep the lines of communications open between Hal Leonard and the band directors to address their needs and look for opportunities. In his first letter to band directors in July of 1947, Roger invited them to attend a clinic featuring one of the best known directors in the country. Roger was also smart enough to know that if these directors did attend, it would probably be with their wives, and he better plan on having something for them to do as well. 
Like any good salesman, Roger knew his customers, and luckily he had Martha, Mary and Joe, and the other merry wives of Han Leonard to help with the entertaining. As copyright laws changed, arranging popular music for high school bands without a copyright was actually illegal, and they knew they needed to learn more about copywriting in a hurry. So off Hal and Roger went to New York, the Gotham City of Music Publishing, to get educated about copyrights and to bring some home. They were rebuffed by all the publishers except one, E.B. Marks Publishing, who owned the license for the big hit of 1947, I wonder who's kissing her now. Harold quickly created easy-to-play band arrangements, which Roger printed up and promoted through a direct mail campaign to local band directors, sold like hotcakes. Soon another New York music publisher got wind of E.B. Mark's success with these young upstarts from the Midwest and began licensing their pop tunes to Hal Leonard as well. No one had ever considered extending the range of their pop tunes to include high school band arrangements, or the additional income that might come from it. Hal Leonard had created a whole new industry. And given the shelf life of a pop tune, the licensing publishers quickly realized that the faster a band arrangement could be marketed, the more money they would make. As the team member who obtained the copyrights for band and choral arrangements throughout most of his years at Hal Leonard, Roger and my mother often entertained managers from different artists at our home when they were in town for business with Hal Leonard. My sisters and I were the entertainment. Sometimes we'd play guitar and sing, sometimes my sister Judy would sing, and sometimes I would play my violin. I remember on three separate occasions being told that the reps for the Beatles, Engelbert Humperdinck, and Herb Alpert would be there. Before they left, Dad would ask everyone to sign a table that he had gotten from his office when they did some remodeling. So when they came to the house, in pencil, they would sign their name. Anybody who came to the house would sign it. Then the next day, he would take the table down in the basement, and he'd take a wood burner, and he'd etch their, over their penciled names into this table. And all we know, all I know for sure, is that it's pre-1965, and it continued until his death. So there's a lot of names, there's a lot of family, it's the, it's the, the reps from Engelbert and the Beatles and, you know, anybody else who came to the house. John, Ringo, no. Yeah. <laughs> Roger used another marketing technique that was also very way ahead of its time. Automatic renewal, like Netflix and Amazon, Amazon Prime subscriptions. To guarantee a band director would have the latest pop tunes before the kids moved on to something else, Hal Leonard would send out complete band arrangements within weeks of it being on the hit break. All the band director needed to do was sign up for an automatic order. Brilliant. With the huge demand for more band arrangements, they hired new staff, including Frank Cofield and Zane Van Offen, to keep up with rising customer demand. A demand, I'm sorry. <laughs> At first they used an old beat-up mimeograph, remember those, machine, to print up their band arrangements, but soon realized they needed something bigger. At first they contracted with Winona Printing to do the work, but soon realized that to get those band arrangements out quickly, they couldn't rely on someone else's print schedule. So they bought their own large printing presses, bindery equipment, and printing supplies. And all of us worked in those departments, by the way, in high school. <laughs> we already had the equipment and know-how to create the artwork and set up a printing job since they owned their own photo studio. And to ensure the product went out on time, they set up their own distribution department. Hal Leonard, from the very start, was a vertically integrated publisher. I had to ask what that meant. It means that they did everything from nuts to bolts, start to finish, to better serve their customers. The publishing business quickly outgrew the offices on Center Street, and in 1951, they moved to 64 East 2nd Street. Some of you know that as the building where the um, Winona Post now is now, and that was a newspaper started by John, Hal's third son, uh, son our brother, and his wife, Fran. Uh, as the publishing business continued to grow, they started taking over more and more of the offices on that 2nd Street block, and uh, the Edstrom Music Store would move there in 1964. 
But first, let's go back to the Edstrom Music Store in the 50s and the Hammond organ era. Mm -hmm. The easy to play chord organ was invented by a Hammond organ in 1950. It allowed the player to play full chords with the touch of the left hand, to play the melody with the right hand, and then with the feet doing their, uh, mm -hmm. their own thing down below. This was a perfect instrument for the music men to represent because, like their teaching ethic, it gave the player a sense of mastery right from the start. The Edstrom Music Store's marketing strategy was simple. Convince the very young to the very old that they could master the instrument from the start. All they needed was to gain exposure of this marvelous instrument to the widest possible audience because, as they would say, seeing and hearing is believing. And they had three key strategies that they could the first strategy, using the highly effective new media of TV to demonstrate just how easy it was to play. The salesmen slash musicians at Esther Music Store performed a live show every Thursday night on KROC TV in Rochester. By the way, the musicians, musicians weren't, uh, weren't necessarily the stars. Listen to the copy in this ad. Gather around your TV set for this fresh, sparkling, informal music session starring the fabulous Hammond Chord Organ. They make it do everything but jump through hoops. <laughs> the print ad then goes on to tell people they should start their children playing the Hammond organ. It's only $4.95 a week to not only rent the organ, but for the lessons and sheet music too. The second strategy was using the tried and true method of personal selling at markets, county fairs, and trade shows, and getting likely buyers to give their name and addresses for follow-up calls. Uh, listen to Cousin Steve tell this story. I would be going to the county fairs. And they would have a carousel, little miracle wrap, they put a cord organ on it, and on the other side they would put a spinet organ. And uh, we would get on the carousel, and Tiger and Tom would start out. You know, you'd be first, and they got a microphone, so you would say, I'm Tom Estrom, and I'm going to play, uh, you know, merrily we roll along. <laughs> the Harold and Dad and their group of salesmen understood that if you can draw a crowd, you can get a date. And so Nancy playing, or, or uh, Tom, anybody playing live performance would have people at a county fair, they'd come up and they'd watch, what's this? And then they, this, you know, I talk about the showmanship element of it. Where did they get the idea to have a miracle round with organs on it? Across <laughs> <laughs> crowd, and you've got a live person, a little kid, like they see in a frilly dress or something. <laughs> and it's going around in a circle. So people come up and they look, what is this? That, that, and then the sales of the circulate. And they would have to pick up paper they would hand out and uh, right there. And they would have, uh, they were just really, you know, you say, oh, they were so creative. But it was just a great huddle. They would come up and, you know, oh, are you enjoying the show? Yes. Uh, would, would you like to win a uh, free head of organ? Yes. Just come out this form around. Take it up into the house and get little Johnny to play a number, and that thrilled them all. 
The other thing that before that they did was they bought some used DeSoto limousines from the Mayo doctors who were selling them off at the time. And the, this limousine was so wide and so long that they could get an organ in between the back seat and the front divider where the jump seats could be pulled up. And it would fit in there. With suicide doors, I don't think, would fit just beautifully in there. And they'd again, take it out wherever they had to take it and move it into the house and hopefully come back without it. <laughs> Well, they deployed the cutest bunch of salespeople you could imagine, us, their families. <laughs> Just like TikTok videos, they shared precious images of adorable children, totally in command of their instruments. The implied message was, if these kids could play it, so could yours. As a very little girl in the 1960s, my debut on TV included riser pedals for my short little legs. Um, it, my dad had them custom made, and he would haul it in to where we would perform, and they fit right over the existing pedals. But they were about three feet tall, and they were as wide as the as you know the the regular pedals on the organ. And it all demonstrated that even a wee one could play the Hammond organ. <laughs> Every one of the kids in the three families had a turn at performing on TV, mostly in Rochester, but once in a while in La Crosse. The TV show was 15 minutes and was just just followed or followed the uh, Dinah Shore show, which was also 15 minutes. Uh, the point was always to promote the Hammond organ. It was a variety show. So as girls danced and many different instruments were played by all three families. I played bass fiddle for a while. Uh, I would have to get on a stool to play the instrument, and I could always depend on a titter of laughter when I did that. I didn't really like that, but I knew it was part of the marketing scheme. <laughs> the third strategy was creating a self-taught manual that helped the Hammond organ owner to master the instrument quickly. Hal created the pointer system in 1953. His motivation was to make learning fun and easy, and sure enough, Newbies and their parents would practically break down crying. It was so easy. they just point their finger and within minutes they were playing their very own song. The Hamlet marketing team would put people on TV with no previous knowledge of playing the organ. They'd learn how to play live on the air. They would print and pack the pointer system books into the bench of every organ they'd sell. They taught it to kids in the classroom and to sale reps in the conference rooms. Everybody loved it. They soon became the number one seller of Hammond organs in the U.S. per capita. In the entire country, they had the most sales per capita, with a lot of these little gimmicks we're talking to you about, but it worked. Hammond then decided to buy the pointer system, pack them into the benches of all the organs sold throughout the entire country. It was called a bench pack. And then they got a call from Wurlitzer and other organ companies that wanted the book for their organ benches, and because they owned the pointer system, they sold it to them as well. But once Hammond discovered that competitors wanted the system, they lowered the boom. Sound effects, thanks. They threatened to lift them, uh, they threatened to lift the franchise. Hammond had a big decision to make. A few months earlier, somebody had told them that they should get out of the organ business and fully commit to publishing, and that's exactly what they did. So at that point, they got out of the Hammond organ business and went into publishing. So they're no longer organ salesmen, they're now 100% uh, publishers, and in the late 50s and 60s, their businesses continued to grow, fueled in part by the innovations that they were um, so famous for not the, not the least of which was the in, invention of the typeset music typeset computer. Now, it was the first company to develop a computer to create a sheet of music, replacing um, laborious methods that had been used that, that, that were really done by hand, uh, and were of course much slower. Hal Leonard was first to print high quality computer generated music, and was uh, incredibly efficient. And so they, um, they were able to teach. Um, they were able to teach better, and they were able to um, keep track of their inventory and their sales. And uh, so they were able to sell out if they got an order. They were able to sell, send that order out within a day, which was very unusual. So other big publishers were still using 
three by five card in shoe boxes. <laughs> In 1970, Hal, Roger, and Ed were approached by Keith Martin, a sales and marketing executive from Milwaukee, whose company had been competing with the pointer system for a number of years. He suggested a joint venture to create a whole new line of instruction manuals for multiple instruments that were packaged with helpful cassette tapes. Learning Unlimited was born. Keith also began managing the marketing and administrative duties of the allied companies. The building at 64 East Second had served the needs of Hamlet Publishing reasonably well, but the business had exploded to the point that naturally more space and modernized surroundings were most desperately needed. So in 1974, they built and moved into a beautiful new facility at 960 East Mark Street. They also subsequently built another production plant across the street. And then, as you've probably all seen and mentioned earlier, they developed a um, Distribution, which is the, the largest of its kind in the world, distribution center just uh, east of Menards. Um, when they actually developed that, they had such a complex uh, system within the, uh, the way that they used the, the various rollers and so on. They had to have somebody come in from Germany to program the, the, the entire setup at the, that uh, facility. But that's where it all happens right now. And uh, uh, you can... Um, see the, you know, the, the benefit of having that kind of production. Then, be, then began, the, began the process of buying one publishing company after another in the music industry, the most of, important of which was Chapel, which was at that time the biggest, but the agreement they, they had in buying Chapel made Haller the world's largest publisher. And that started in 1981. You can see the familiar music of and they haven't looked back since. They secured copyrights for some of the most well-known singers, <laughs> bands, and musicals, and uh, such as the Beatles, as well as the Disney catalog and all of their music and movies. Uh, pretty impressive. Steve just added that. I, it's a, no, it's big. It's very impressive. So the reason that those, um, but we have a list of alliances now, um, and it, it says collaboration has made Hal Leonard the number one publisher. Now I'm going to talk a little more slowly because you can see how many there are and how slowly they're going through the alphabet. Uh, the reason that those alliances were so successful has a lot to do with what Hal Leonard is able to do with any new pop tune, choral, piano, guitar, uh, orchestral um, band arrangements, and from complex to easy play. Once again, from the early days, the trick was to discover the right pop tune and turn it into marketable arrangements for multiple instru instruments in a matter of weeks. So, um, examples of some of, uh, I, in fact, I went to Helena today because I just wanted, I love it when you go in the door and you see all the really famous pieces of music and musicals that um, that are connected with Hal Leonard. And uh, some examples, Endless Love, My Heart Will Go On, uh, Cats, Wicked, Beautiful, the, let's see, the Carol King musical, Les Miserables, uh, Hamilton, and uh, Jersey Boys, and on and on. It's, it's fun. They're, they uh, do a lot of productions, and uh, it's fun to think of all the th different things they do with each song and each musical. On March 29, 1985, Hal Leonard was sold to Keith Mardak and others in the management group out of the Milwaukee office. But Hal, Ev, and Roger continued to consult with the new management team. The reason that none of Hal, Ev, and Roger's 13 children ever went into the business is simple. It was written into their business bylaws that no children would be part of the company, except for summer jobs. Luke Edstrom, son of Hal's eldest, Lee, is the only ancestor of any of the three men who is associated with today's Hal Leonard. Here's a recording of Luke's experience. Okay, in 2017, oh, I did want to mention one thing, and that's that um, in, in, in becoming involved with Hal Leonard, if you've created something, you want to get it out there. There's no one with a bigger contact list than Hal Leonard. 
and uh, we got a good uh, a good taste of how um, uh, of how big and uh, how creative uh, and how productive so how it is when we went to the NAM convention. NAM stands for National Association of Music Merchandisers Annual or Annual Convention. We are invited by Keith Mardek, and we are also invited by Luke. And uh, we uh, there it was a dinner celebrating Hal Leonard's 70th year, 70th anniversary, and uh, it was a convention that Hal, Ev, and Roger went to every year without fail. And in the early days, it was in Chicago. It was exciting to see the company's progress and witness that the personal touch and sense of camaraderie had not been lost. Afterwards, we all commented on the good vibes. Uh, and in recent years, um, it seems that nothing has been lost in terms of people really getting along. And uh, we, I met, I was happy to sit next to Larry Morton, who is now the president of, of Hal Leonard. And uh, I, was, I was just impressed with how personable he was and uh, how approachable. They seem to uh, still um, have, have a way of bringing out the best in everyone. Um, Helen had the largest booth at the convention, and this was quite a change from the early days. In Chicago, um, they, had, they, they were definitely little frogs in the big pond, and now I think for quite a few years now they've been the biggest, haven't they? And this is, this, we just happen to have someone staying in our house who's come from uh, uh, California to write a book, I think, and he's in music, and he told us that he was at the NAM uh, convention, and he took this picture, and you can see this is the 75th year, and what's really cute is <laughs> on, the, on the left there, uh, Alan F. and Roger. We've been describing what these men did separately and together, but this seems a good place to insert portraits of each of them, since they were known entirely different in personality and unique gifts. And still, there was something that contributed to the chemistry that made them complement each other so effectively. Lorraine Ashland, one of their first employees at the music store, and the one that did the company accounting for almost well over 60 years in her age of 80 plus, said that Ed was the accelerator. Harold was the brakes, and Roger the steady hand on the wheel, but always ready with an oil can and grease. <laughs> it was very fitting that we're presenting this around Father's Day, because above all else, each of these men was a warm and loving father. My dad was a dedicated family man, and who adored both his wife and kids, but also his larger family, both blood relatives and the people he worked with. While he was a hard driver in the sense that he didn't have much choice about practicing, he also encouraged us in such a way that we didn't consider it a burden or sacrifice. It was just what we did, and we loved doing it together. I look back at how hard we worked and how I, now I realize that there was a gift in making it seem like a normal routine. He was very affirming and let us know how proud he was of us. He also had an enthusiasm that was contagious. They had a complete trust of each other, and the warmth of that overarching faith in what they created is still present today. Hal had an armchair kind of warmth about him, and I love to tell the story of how every day when he went to work, and I think this was almost without fail, he would go through the bindery and then the press, and uh, he knew everybody, he knew their name, names, and he cared about them, and he, he'd, uh, whoever it was, he'd take their shoulder and say, how are you doing, Phyllis? <laughs> I just, I loved watching that, and, uh, and that engagement. Uh, he was personal, he was creative, and uh, he was passionate about what he did and passionate about other people. Um, I'd like to reminisce a moment. We we got a little bit of an idea from Steve about his dad, but Uncle Ed was truly a wonderful uncle. One of the best cheerleaders you could have, very free with the compliment. And I'll always remember his enthusiasm, his strong opinions, and his storytelling skill. All of his kids inherited that skill. There's never a dull moment with him. Uh, we haven't even mentioned his passion for golfing. He was a perfectionist who tackled sports with a kind of a, a zeal, a drive, and a determination that couldn't be matched. Um, and I had to help get Nick's help in explaining what this was. I just remembered that he was trying to improve his drive, right? He's having a swing. <laughs> his swing. <laughs> and so in order to do it, he was in, in the garage, he had a... Uh, <laughs> I'm the <a> golfer. <laughs> he was trying to change his golf swing. <laughs> <laughs> 
and his grounds in California. And in order to do so, he had charts along all the walls of the garage, and his determination was he was going to have to do this new swing 20,000 times in order to change and successfully complete his new golf swing. He had every one of these swings he would mark down one at a time, a Roman numerals up to 20,000 to finally get that golf swing down. It tells you what kind of determination he had. <laughs> because he loved new and innovative technology. He was very creative and he built ships and had quite a talent uh, of art that he inherited from his mother who was quite an artist and painted quite a few paintings. He was humble about his lifelong contribution to Hal Leonard with a quiet confidence. He lived the longest of the three men and remained sharp and industrious to the end. Roger was a loyal family man and was active in the community as well through the Winona Exchange Club, the Winona Country Club, the Municipal Band, and the Masons. In the 1960s, the Masons had a motorcycle squad that performed at parades and celebrations. Occasionally, he'd bring his motorcycle home because he had to wash it and polish it and make it look really good before the parade. And I would beg him to take me for a ride. Mm -hmm. And reluctantly, he pulled me on behind him, and we'd go around the block, and I just held on as tight as I could. Dad loved the Mississippi River and duck hunting. I was the Labrador Retriever. <laughs> he loved fishing, he loved boating. This was pretty much before the age of computers, but Roger was the first to hop on that train. Plus, he was always at the cutting edge of anything of a technical nature. He was humble about his incredible contribution to the company, but he also had a peaceful self-assurance. He was a loyal family man, and I have to say that he tried to keep up with Ev's golf skills because anybody who came over to the house would go down in the basement and they'd practice putting. <laughs> As for the magic chemistry that helped them create such a successful company, it had, had more to do with love for each other than anything else. They recognized and celebrated each other's gifts. They were smart enough to let the person most capable of whichever job that was at hand take the reins. Each one of them was very positive and fired up by nature. That's what made for the special energy that kept lighting the fire. None of what fueled their passion for music and the business had to do with getting rich quick. It was their love of music and for each other. They brought out the best in each other and those who were around them. Hal died. Oh. This is Luke. My name is Luke Edstrom. I'm Luke. the grandson of Harold Hal. And Great nephew of his brother, Ev Leonard Edstrom. My journey at Hal started 15 years ago when I decided to change career directions, pack up my things on the East Coast, and give the Midwest life a shot in the family business. I started in the telesales department answering questions and taking orders from our customers, and it was not easy work. 
Many of our customers we deal with are professional musicians. And I was fresh off the last 10 years as director of operations of three children's fitness centers in Maryland. <laughs> the catalog was massive, overwhelming even. But walking down the hallways every day and seeing Grandpa Hal and Uncle Ev adorned on the walls of our beautiful Milwaukee corporate office motivated me to work as hard as I could to prove my worth and strive to become the best I could be. Fast forward 15 years now, and I've taken on many more responsibilities and dealt with some of the biggest and best accounts that Hal and I works with. It's been a wonderful 15 years, and I couldn't have asked for a better company to work for, and I'm especially grateful for all the wonderful people I've met on the way. The best part of working for Hal Leonard all these years, besides cool perks like meeting all the coolest and best musicians in the industry. Just last week, Stevie Wonder came to our booth at the NAMM show in Los Angeles. To be able to now work for the company that my family built from the ground up, and have the opportunity to bring my children and family to this magical little gem of the city on a more regular basis, makes me feel extremely proud and fulfilled. Hal died on February 23, 1996 in Winona. He was 82 years young, and he's buried at Woodlawn Cemetery. Ev died March 19, 2000 in Palm Desert, California. He was 84. His ashes were spread about his favorite golf course. <laughs> Raj died on June 13, 2006 in Winona. He was 88. He's buried in Woodlawn Cemetery, his ashes placed inside his clarinet and his clarinet case. The story was picked up by national news bureaus and Paul Harvey did a segment about my dad and his resting place on his nationally syndicated radio program. Now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> and now you know the story too. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and to hear the story of Helen.